me introduce the speaker before uh, we start the presentation. So it's our pleasure to have uh, Shana Watts uh, to be here to present his work on implicit differentiation of flat variational kind of algorithms. Yeah, as shown in uh, the first slides, uh, he's from WS Security. We also have security that but we are in Singapore. I think uh, for this work is uh, done uh, while you are in Senadu, like before, right? Yeah. So um, I think we can get started now and the uh, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. So this work was done as part of the MyTax Accelerate project. It's a fellowship that you can get in Canada where you part of a university, but you go to a company and uh, do a project in a company. So I collaborated with Nathan Killorn from Zanadu and Juan Felipe Carasquilla Alvarez from Vector Institute for AI. And I think he's also assistant professor at University of Waterloo. Uh, and, and the topic was implicit differentiation of variational quantum algorithms. So actually let's start way back Let's start from the 1700s. So in the 1700s, there was this problem that uh, Descartes gave to Fermat. And from that problem uh, comes out this nice idea of implicit differentiation, which almost every one of us would have used in some point during uh, the university period or even uh, senior high school. So I will talk a little bit about this implicit differentiation, the idea, it's very simple. Then I will discuss how you can take this idea and apply it to compute gradients through the solution of variational quantum algorithms. So the idea is that you have a variational quantum algorithm where you start with some Hamiltonian that is parameterized with A and you have a variational wave function. Can you also see my uh, pointer? When I yes, we can see this. it. Yeah, okay, great. And you have a variational state and then you obtain some solution, some variationally obtained ground state. So now, if you want to see how this ground state changes as you change this parameter A, the parameter in the Hamiltonian, how do you compute this gradient? And this would be the central question that we are going to work with. And uh, the idea is that you cannot very simply write this solution down because it's the solution of a variation algorithm, which you might have found iteratively with some minimization procedure and you cannot just apply reverse mode auto differentiation or back propagation through this whole algorithm because you don't have an explicit solution. It's just uh, the solution is in some sense implicitly, implicitly defined. And then I will show some three very nice cool applications of this uh, idea. The first one for condensed matter physics that's applicable to also different other areas, which is this example, how, how do you compute ground state gradients? The second one is more interesting uh, for machine learning or quantum machine learning algorithms where we can do hyperparameter tuning of quantum machine learning algorithms with gradient descent. Because we have gradients, access to gradients, we can actually tune uh, hyper or uh, find hyper gradients and tune them instead of doing a grid search or something like that. And this idea is also been used in machine learning, like deep tuning, deep learning, hyperparameters with implicit differentiation. There's a paper on optimizing millions of hyperparameters uh, where the hyperparameters are like uh, one for each no, uh, neuron in a neural network and you can still train them with implicit differentiation efficiently. And the third one, this is the interesting one that's very novel for us, at least because we have uh, we tried to see what else can you do with this idea. And the third one is basically, how do you create an entangled state starting from a random initial state without actually defining what the entangled state is without just with, with a vague definition or not vague, but rather concrete definition of a geometric measure of entanglement and optimizing it through implicit differentiation. So I will discuss these three examples and then we can have some more discussion on what are the caveats and where this fails and what's, what are the problems with this. Okay, so let's go to the, to the origin. It's in actually 1638, Descartes uh, proposed or gave a challenge to find tangents to this curve. This curve was called the folium of Descartes after that. And the idea was that this, this was not a curve that's 
very easy to find tangents at that point. They didn't have a method to find tangents at all points in Descartes. And Descartes was very happy that he had a technique that allowed the computation of the tangent at the vertex. When uh, Fermat, who, who was quite a young mathematician, not so famous at that time, he saw this problem and he computed the tangents, not just at the vertex, but at any arbitrary point and kind of outwitted Descartes and kind of proved the intellectual superiority of a method that he had. And at that time, as it was, people would do mathematics with this kind of a challenge. Someone would challenge and then someone would come solve it. And they were very uh, protective of the methods that they use and things like that. So this was very interesting. Uh, you can read about this kind of battle between them in this very nice article. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it. And the idea that Fama used was basically using implicit differentiation. What you can do is you can just write this equation down and then take the derivative on both sides, rearrange dy by dx, and you come up with the explicit expression of it. Even though you cannot write a simple formulation for what y is in terms of x here, so you can differentiate, but for the gradient, you can really write a very simple expression just with this. And we have done this, let's say, in some advanced calculus class or uh, when we learn differentiation. Okay, so why is it now interesting for quantum physics? Why did we start looking at this problem? One of the things that actually Juan and Nathan, they, they started thinking about it before I came into the picture was that these ground states that are computed from variational quantum algorithms, the gradients of these ground states are very interesting properties. So in, in terms of uh, condensed matter, sometimes these are called susceptibilities, generalized susceptibilities. I think in quantum chemistry, if you can find gradients like this, so imagine you have a Hamiltonian where the parameter now are the positions of the particles. So you have a quantum system where you have a certain geometry and the particles are laid out in a certain geometry and that creates your Hamiltonian where this A is how what's the relative distance between each particle, so something like that. You find the ground state or ground state energy here and then you want to see what other geometry reduces this ground state energy. So if you can get these gradients and these become very interesting, not just for optimization, but also as a physical quantity. So I think these are called uh, nuclear forces uh, in some cases, but at the heart of it, they are, the central picture is the same. Um, and then of course, if you have access to these gradients, you can do a lot of things and people are calculating these gradients uh, numerically or in some specific cases, analytically, or uh, with some kind of uh, approach, Monte Carlo approach or things like that. So you don't, you don't have a very easy way to calculate these gradients. So this is very interesting because if you can calculate these gradients, you have a lot of interesting applications all across different kinds of physics. Then uh, actually when we started this project, we also saw a very nice paper uh, on the same idea. Uh, by Ricky T. Q. Chen. I think this person is might be at Facebook now, uh, is a computer scientist. And they applied this idea for a very interesting problem of steady state optimization and inverse design. And the idea is that if you have a system that gives a steady state, and now the steady state is dependent on some Hamiltonian parameter, how do you change this parameter to reach a different steady state? And you can again apply implicit differentiation to do this optimization. Uh, we tried also, we, we also tried this for control problems in a closed system, but actually it didn't work because uh, in a, you don't have a natural steady state. You, you, you have to go to open quantum systems and then there have been also applications of not just not implicit differentiation, but this adjoint method to solve problems in autonomous error correction and things like that. So this was also very interesting. And we, unfortunately, we were quite late because this would have been a really nice example for us also. So we had to work harder to get more applications. And then of course, in machine learning and uh, the whole picture of automatic differentiation, these implicit gradients have allowed hyperparameter optimization. So usually what happens is you have parameters of your model and then hyperparameters. Let's say the strength of your L1 regularization, learning rate, and so on and so on. And in order to optimize those hyperparameters, you have to go do a grid search. 
But now you can actually calculate these hyper gradients once you first train your main optimization parameters. You can also then get access to the hyperparameter gradients and then tune these hyperparameters instead of doing a grid search. So this really helps you in hyperparameter optimization. And another very interesting thing is that with the integration of these tools that allow you to compute implicit gradients uh, that are available in JAX, it's a different uh, auto differentiation library from Google, and the combination with Penilane, which is a software by Zanadu to run quantum circuits, but also apply automatic differentiation. And some tools that are based on JAX for optimization, you can suddenly see that the leap to go from the machine learning side to the quantum computing side is extremely easy. It's not something that you have to sit and write really long lines of code to scale it up. You just plug these three things in and you can get access to these hyper gradients for different kinds of problems. So actually this was very nice because we didn't have to struggle to build all the tools that we need. The tools were already there. So let's look at a little bit of the math behind implicit differentiation. The central idea is that uh, here, I'm just showing it for a two variable problem. You have some function that depends on two variables, Z and A. So just labeling Z as a parameter and A as a hyperparameter to make it easy, but it doesn't matter actually. And then you have some implicitly defined solution that depends on this function F Z of A. So you have some optimality condition that you are satisfying always. So let's say F Z of A equals zero. That's the that's this optimality condition. It defines some level curves. Now what you want to do is you want to say that if this condition is satisfied by some function Z of A, then you, you are guaranteed by this theorem called the implicit function theorem that Z of A is analytic. Even though you cannot write what Z of A is, it is analytic around a local point, basically, where this, this holds. And then because this is an analytic function, you can do the same trick as we did with uh, Folia on the, the card. You can just write down this, this function, differentiate both sides, pick up the dy by dx, and then get basically gradients of this. And if you actually work it out, it's in three or four lines of uh, three or four steps, you can actually see that the formula for the implicit gradient is something very simple. It's taking the derivative of this with respect to A, this with respect to Z at the solution point, and then just plugging it into this formula. So what you want is you want a solution Z star A that satisfies this. So you want to lie at some point here and you want access to the local gradients around this solution point. And then if you plug this in in this formula, you get the grade, uh, implicit gradient at the solution point. Of course, there's a caveat here. And the caveat is you should be able to do this inversion. So if there are, let's say Z and A are not just two parameters, but like a lot of parameters, this becomes a Jacob, this becomes Jacobian and then you have to invert this Jacobian. There is an efficient way to do this inversion actually uh, iteratively. And then you have to, of course, have the solution in hand. Like you have to first solve this, this problem. So in some cases, these are fixed point equations. So you can just start with a random initial point, run a couple of steps and then find a fixed point. In some other cases, these are optimization problems where you have to run an iterative optimization and obtain this solution. But once you have this solution, and the gradients, which is not so complicated for the quantum computing cases that we are discussing, uh, you can plug them in this formula and get these. So just as a side note, this also works for fixed point equations. So if you have some other function that is equal to Z, you can just take it this side and you know, rewrite the same optimality function. So the starting point is this, and then what we need are these uh, Jacobians. Is there any question? on this. Okay. So here is actually the formal statement of the implicit differentiation, uh, implicit function theorem, which says that if you have some analytic function of complex variables, and we actually write it for complex variables because we are interested in complex variables. Let's say you have unitaries uh, or you have a quantum state, then you 
don't just want to have uh, real valued parameters. Maybe the Hamiltonian parameters are real, but that could be complex valued. Like I said, these are the coefficients of a wave function. And if FZA is analytic uh, in some neighborhood around a point, and if you have this condition satisfied at that local area, and you can invert basically this Jacobian, then there exists a unique analytical solution function to this in this neighborhood. Because this is analytic, you can actually do this trick and find the gradients of this. So we can actually just work out a very basic example. This is actually the curve for this plot that I have. If you just artificially make some function, uh, some fixed point equation, something like this, or something like this, you can actually solve it because this is easy to solve. And you can see that the solution function is one minus one by a just by solving this. And then you can differentiate this and get this uh, basically the gradient. But what if you couldn't solve this? What if this was not as simple as just these three steps, you know? So then you can also apply implicit differentiation. And then with implicit differentiation, as long as you have access to these local gradients, and here actually I just plug them in, whatever the value is, you come and see the same result. So, but now the difference is here, you have done something analytically here, you would have plugged the value of the gradients that you would have obtained and the solution point and kind of obtained this without even knowing what the analytical solution is. And this is just, you know, a very basic sanity check to see that this, this formula works. Okay, so well, uh, any questions so far? I guess like very basic introduction to implicit differentiation. Actually, uh, I think uh, people from University of Toronto, they have a whole uh, idea called implicit layers that stems from this to make new neural network layers that are called implicit layers instead of having a well-defined you know, feed-forward neural network, you just define implicit layers. For example, uh, neural ODEs, they are one class of implicit layers, or deep equilibrium models, they are also kind of implicit layers. So it's a very interesting concept, that simple concept, but that can lead to something very interesting. So what we try to do is we try to see, okay, what can we use this implicit differentiation idea for in variational quantum algorithms? And I go back to the same formulation that we have. We have a variational quantum algorithm. We have a variational ansatz, a Hamiltonian that we want to find the ground state of by changing Z and then obtaining this ground state. And then we want to see what will happen if we change the Hamiltonian parameters to the ground state, or let's say ground state energy or any other property of the ground state, any expectation value on the ground state. So formally, what you are trying to obtain is the solution function this. So you want to minimize over Z, the variational parameters, uh, the, this expectation value, the energy, but you don't have access to this function analytically, but you want to get this gradient. So what you do is you cast this problem in the language of implicit differentiation. So you are looking for a, a function that looks that gives you a level curve, so to speak, or optimality condition. And this function basically is that at the solution point, you know that the gradient of this energy function would be zero. So you can start here. You can say, okay, this is my optimality condition. This is where I have the zero. And then you can differentiate both sides of this equation, take dy by dx again as before, and then obtain this quantity. And as I wrote before, it's the same formula. So what you now want is you want basically the solution. So somehow you variationally obtain a solution. And then you want these two Jacobians. So what's dz by df, da by df? Now note that d, dz by df actually is a second order derivative because already you know, you're defining your f as the gradient of energy. Thankfully, these things you can compute on a, on a quantum computer even now because of uh, these parameter shift rules. And I think Penny Lane already has all these things implemented. So you can get these higher order gradients directly from the quantum computer. So what do we need? We need a solver to numerically obtain these solution points. We need access to the local gradients at the solution point, And of course, an efficient way to invert DZ by uh, DZ. 
of F. Uh, these three ingredients are there. Uh, it's already implemented in this library called Jacksop. We re-implemented it, but actually everything worked perfectly fine. I actually will not talk about how to invert this, but it's uh, in some sense it's uh, it's again an, a slight iterative procedure or solving another optimization problem. Okay, so then we have all the things that we need for this picture. We we have a quantum computer. We have some variational uh, ansatz, a Hamiltonian that we want to find ground state. We have some way to compute energy or expectation values, and also these gradients that the classical computer takes in, plugs it in this formula, and then gives us back implicit gradients. So let's see, how, how does this picture now help us? The first thing that we try to do is to compute something called generalized susceptibility or susceptibility uh, using variational quantum algorithms. So let's say you have this Hamiltonians, uh, Eisenkind-like Hamiltonians, spin Hamiltonian, and let's say you have some kind of a force term, okay, that something that depends on a parameter and some operator A. So what you want to do is you want to find the ground state of this, and the ground state of this will now depend on actually this variational parameter. Right? And you want to see how does, what kind of the response, how does this ground state energy or any other function change as you change this quantity? And this, 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 base, this quantity is called susceptibility, fidelity, susceptibility, generalized susceptibility, different kinds of uh, susceptibility. So the way that, you, that we do it is basically we write a variational algorithm that finds a solution or ground state solution to this Hamiltonian. And then we plug in all the implicit differentiation formula to simply compute this gradient. So actually what we want is not just, uh, a, let's say a gradient of this whole wave function. We actually want a gradient of some property of this wave function. So let's say you measure some expectation value. And in this case, you actually just measure what's the expectation value of the, of the operator A. And then you want this gradient. So you can work out that in order to compute this gradient, actually, just applying the chain rule, you need this implicit uh, gradient in, in the formula. And then, of course, you need these other two quantities, which you can actually compute easily. So the interesting thing is this has been done for energy. There is a theorem called the hellman feynman theorem, which says that if this quantity A is energy, is the ground state energy, then actually you don't need this term. This term vanishes, you can prove it. Uh, you only have this quantity, which is, which is easy to compute. It's the expectation value for the derivative of this operator A with respect to A. And this, this is easy to compute. But if it's any other property that you are trying to compute except the energy, this, this theorem does not apply because you have this extra term. It was very nice. Uh, actually, Juan worked out this formula in the beginning before we even started the project to see that, okay, this really simple trick is able to now give you something beyond this Hel uh, Hellman Feynman theorem and allow you to compute these uh, gr gradients. So in order to just check numerically that this works, what we try to do, of course, this depends on how well have you approximated the ground state of this Hamiltonian and uh, the kind of noise you have and things like that. So what we did was we just took a variational quantum circuit uh, with different layers and L, the layer L here means how many uh, kind of, uh, what's the depth of this circuit. And we tried to first, find the ground state of this function, and then plug in the implicit differentiation machinery and obtain the gradient. And then we compared it with the exact gradients. And in this case, we can actually find the exact gradients by diagonalizing the Hamiltonian, finding the, the ground state directly, because it's a very small system, and then compared it. And it, it works well as long as you have sufficient depth. Like with L equals four, you will see that it's, it's a little noisy. With L equals to five, it's almost exact. So the, the exciting thing is that now you, if you have like a I don't know, 100, 100 qubit device and you can write the spin Hamiltonian with 100 spins and things like that and compute ground state, you can plug all the things that you need you know, in the implicit differentiation formula and then do the same thing 
not as easy as it sounds, but in principle, you can do the same thing to compute the susceptibilities for really large systems, which is very interesting. Uh, the second example that we tried was hyperparameter optimization, because this is the use case that machine learning has for implicit differentiation at this point. And the idea is that you have some trainable parameters in a model, and we took this data re-uploading classifier example. You have some training trainable parameters, but you also have some hyperparameters. And let's say the hyperparameters here is some, some regularization strength. So let me go through this, this example. You start from, let's say, a single qubit state. You apply a unitary with some parameter. These parameters, x, they are your data. So let's say it's a 2D classification problem, you know, blue dots or red dots. This x will just actually be two parameters. Uh, and the third parameter of this unitary would be zero. So you would just maybe give 0 0.5, 0 0.5, which means that there is a point at 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Then you have the trainable parameters. These are similar to the weights in the neural network. And then you repeat these layers again and again, and you train these quantities. Finally, you do a measurement. If it comes zero, it's you know, a blue dot. If it comes one, it's a red dot. And this becomes, uh, actually, this can be proved to be a universal classifier. And this is what they do in this paper. So what we said is that, OK, when we have parameters u of z1, let's say we want a sparse set of parameters. And sparsity, in this case, can be implemented in this Lagrange multiplier fashion, where we penalize all the non-zero quantities, or actually we penalize the L2 norm of this vector. So we are trying to say that we want this vector, the norm of this vector to be quite small. So uh, what the optimization will try to do is it, it will try to find small values for Z. And this is quite standard if you have like lasso or ridge regression. You just add this L2 normalization that makes sure that you have your parameters don't blow up. But the problem is how do you tune this A of L? How do you get for each layer uh, the strength of this regularization such that you, you do a good classification? And then it, it's very simple. If you just write this uh, a validation loss but with a holdout data set, this validation loss, depending on this parameter A, so here A means you know, the collection of all the ALs, then you can actually start tuning this hyperparameter after each round you tune the main parameters. And then you can see that you know, this validation loss can decrease and all these hyperparameters, and here we had five layers. So these hyperparameters will kind of converge at different values. And then you can see that if you take like, random hyperparameters, random values of these uh, regularization strength, you get a good classification, but your decision boundary is kind of very overfitty rugged. It's not kind of nice and smooth. But if you now actually do this hyperparameter tuning, you get much nicer, smoother decision boundary, which is very interesting that now you are able to also train not just the parameters, but hyperparameters of a quantum machine learning model which was very interesting. But then we, we were like, okay, let's try to get one more result out because this one is interesting, but it was okay. It's kind of like, once you realize that you have implicit differentiation and you want to apply it to VQA, it's very evident. Then this one is directly a machine learning example, like inspired by machine learning example. So Nathan, he was like, yeah, let's try to get one more interesting thing out there. And we, we thought, thought about a lot. We tried different things like error mitigation, uh, optimal control problems, this, that, and, and everywhere we came to a dead end. So one thing then Nathan suggests is like, why don't we look at entanglement? Because there is a measure of entanglement that actually is so looks something like an implicit function. And this measure of entanglement is called, is, is a geometric measure of entanglement. So let, let's discuss quickly what this geometric measure of entanglement is. There are many different measures of entanglement or entanglement witness. Uh, concurrence uh, uh, is one example. But this geometric measure is actually really interesting because it's kind of vague, but it's also kind of powerful because it applies to a wide variety of cases, not just bipartite entanglement. So the idea is that an entangled state is a state that is as far away as possible 
from the whole class of separable quantum states. So let's say in this green bubble, you know that any state in this green bubble is separable. Any state outside this green bubble then would be, would be entangled. So what you want to do is you want to go as far away as possible from this set of separable quantum states. And in order to do that, or just to define how far you are from this bubble, you you write it as a in a geometric way. You say that uh, take the state that you want to compute the entanglement of, and then loop over or search over all possible separable states such that this state is farthest away. So you maximize basically, or you, you maximize this, so you minimize this quantity. So what you are essentially saying is, I want to be as far away in terms of some overlap to the class of separable states. So I don't want to find any separable states. So I don't want to end up in this bubble. And then this is a very uh, interesting definition because it's not explicit, right? You have to solve this optimization problem, loop over all these separable quantum states to actually even obtain how entangled you are. And then if you want to increase this entanglement, uh, you, you cannot do it very simply. But what we realize is that this actually is very similar to the implicit differentiation framework. You are not explicitly defining this function, but you are solving some other optimization problem to get this. So we just recast this problem in terms of implicit differentiation. So we said, okay, let there be a class of separable quantum states with parameter Z and a possible set of entangled state with parameter A. And it's a two-step process. First, you would want to optimize Z. So you would want to do this maximization to get the value of the entanglement. And then at that point, you would want to get the gradients and optimize A so that you go as far away as possible from this class of separable state. And pictorially, you can see something like this. Like you, you start with some Z, you find basically you optimize Z to maximize this. So you come towards the edge of this, uh, this class of separable state. And then you stop here and you find some A that takes you further and further away from this. And in order to do all of this, you then again need to find what would the value of this entanglement uh, witness, this geometric measure of entanglement be, if I have changed my A a little bit. And then you, you would want to co compute these implicit gradients. So we had to now come up with a circuit to do that or some actually operational way to, to implement this. So the way that I, uh, that what I did was uh, we said, okay, let's take one class of variational quantum states that we know is separable because we have only, let's say, single qubit gates in this. And then let's take another uh, quantum circuit, which we know can give entanglement. And that's because we allow some, some operations that can create entanglement. And then we use the swap test to compute this quantity. Once we compute this quantity with the swap test, we can actually do all the things that we want. We can uh, you know, fix these parameters, first optimize these parameters, compute gradients at the solution. So Z star with A fixed, and then we can compute the implicit gradients and then optimize these parameters to have things as far as possible. So is this also, if you've seen generative adversarial network, is this game that you want to play? Like, uh, okay, get as far away as possible from any state that this circuit can create. Uh, and you can ex actually explicitly write down what the this solution function is. You want, uh, you are looking for something that maximizes this overlap because this is the definition of the geometric measure of entanglement. And then you want to change this A that increases uh, this measure of entanglement. Okay, so we tried it out and uh, we took the circuit, made it, uh, did the swap test and everything. And then we found out something very interesting, which is without even defining what a bell state is for a two qubit circuit, we end up at one of the bell states after optimization. So we just iteratively you know, do, play this game of first optimizing this, doing the swap test, finding this, applying implicit differentiation to get gradients here, and then optimizing that. And you can see that this loss function, and this loss function is basically uh, the entanglement or one minus 
this quantity, it it goes down and the entanglement goes up until you know it saturates. And at the point where it saturates, you can see that you end up at one of the bell states. And depending on different initializations, where you start from, uh, you end up at one or the four bell states in this case, which was very interesting because we never define what a maximally entangled state is. We never define what a bell state is. This is we we didn't optimize for the bell state, but we ended up at the maximally entangled state. And so now the interesting question is, since all of this can be done in hardware, we, can this be a very interesting way to go to like three, four, five n qubit entanglement and entangled states and generate n qubit entangled state by just playing this game? Uh, we haven't actually tried more than two qubits, but uh, this would be very interesting. And this brings me to the end of the presentation. In conclusion, we discussed what implicit differentiation is. It's a very powerful technique to compute gradients to any black box optimization that, that you cannot get an analytic solution through. If the solution points can be found by some methods variationally otherwise, and we have access to local gradients at the solution point, we can then compute these implicit gradients. And then it's very interesting that a large number of quantities from different areas of physics, quantum chemistry, variational quantum circuits, quantum machine learning, suddenly become accessible with this idea. And we don't have to work so hard to implement these things because these modular automatic differentiation techniques are already there. We just have to plug and connect the ideas and uh, get things working. And this has very many applications in steady state optimization, inverse design of Hamiltonians, hyperparameter optimization, and other things. Uh, entanglement generation is the novel application that we found quite interesting. Uh, and the caveat is that we actually, at each point, need the solution. So it's it becomes a bit more computationally expensive because of needing to find solution points each time. But at the same time, actually, and the, this is one of the major things that I didn't discuss, is that we get away with not having to backpropagate or do reverse mode auto differentiation through all the steps in this chain, which is simply impossible if you think about it. If you have, let's say, a thousand iterative steps and at each of these thousand iterative steps you have a 20 qubit circuit so you need to keep track of all the intermediate variables that change in this 20 qubit circuit through all the thousand iterative steps memory wise it's just impossible and this is this was one of the motivations also to do this implicit differentiation that you don't need to keep track of what's happening in the black box but on the other hand you would need to each time solve this and find a solution point. And so this is a, a big caveat. Another caveat that's a bit more practical that I didn't discuss is I tried to implement this on IBM devices or any actual hardware devices. The problem there was uh, there might be noise in the calculation of the gradient through parameter shift rules or otherwise. And this noise could make the inversion very inversion of this Jacobian quite unstable or could give very noisy results. At the same time, practically, it was not even possible actually to just queue up uh, Qiskit, for example, to compute these gradients because they would take one evaluation, put it in queue. So even to get one gradient, it was quite difficult. But I think now Qiskit has this uh, way of blocking certain time such that it rapidly allows you to do like around 1,000 runs of an experiment instead of like queuing you up at one after the other but still it was quite slow and time consuming so we we gave up we just did everything in simulation yeah so that's it yeah thanks uh Sanawat for his interesting presentations uh so far i didn't see any question in the chat uh so let me start by asking some question first while people good things about question to be asked um, so over here, like you, because you don't need any uh, kind of analytical form of the function z, right? So what you do need to do is basically just do randomized initializations and just calculate the implicit gradients and uh, get the solution accordingly. Is it uh, this simple? Uh, I didn't understand. So yeah, okay, uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's what yeah, that's what we did. We start from a random initialization and then compute this implicit gradient 
uh, from any random initialization. Yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah. So for this one, right, I'm just wondering uh, what kind of uh, things that you have to be careful when you do this kind of like initialization because um, so, okay, so, so from here, it's not clear to me that how uh, you differentiate local and global minimum. So like for some, some initializations, then you might kind of get trapped to local minimum states, right? It actually does not matter if you are trapped in a local minimum, as long as, uh, let's see, as long as you are, you have this optimality condition satisfied, it's fine to stay in a local minimum because all of this is actually it gives you local gradients. Everything is happening within a neighborhood of a solution point. So it's uh, it's actually not a problem if you end up at a local minima as long as you have the condition satisfied. Yeah, the reason why I asked this because there was a paper in parallel saying that uh, basically BQA are full of like the local minimums and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and there's possibilities that we might not be uh, getting any good solutions even we if we have like this implicit differentiation method methods, right? But well, uh, I guess like this would be the kind of my core issue of BQA. So it's not uh, how how we kind of get the gradient. So uh, so that's fine. Um, and the other question that I have and wondering was how uh, in the paper itself, basically uh, you say how you get can get around with the inversions of the matrix is by solving a system of linear equations, right? And yeah. you use the iterative algorithms. And this, I guess, is what you mean by the solution point at the end of your slides, right? Um, uh, no, um, oh. I, by the, by solution point, I mean this Z, Z star of A, because when you do the VQA, you, you will always need to, let's say, let's go back here. Yeah. You would always need to get some solution point, some Z star A that gives you a energy gradient equals zero. So you need to get some approximate solution to the problem first. And this is what I mean by the solution point. And the other one, the inversion basically is if you have the solution point, then you can actually query and get the gradient at the solution point, the Jacobian. And then you invert this by solving the system of linear equations. Yeah. Um, so I'm not that uh, uh Okay. So, so like, because now you're dealing with a system of linear equation, right? And there might be a case where you have like under or over deterministic system of linear equations, like with that, yeah. and it affects uh, the algorithms per se, because like all as numerics and you, it's pretty hard to know beforehand what kind of like issue that you, yes, like whether your absolutely. system of linear equations is uh, under determinant or over deterministic. Yes, absolutely. But the way that you solve this linear system of equations actually is, is, uh, is not very analytical. It's, it's, uh, I, don't even, I don't have a slide actually to discuss this. Let's see. So you basically try to run another kind of fixed point like iterative algorithm. You, you start with one vector X and you repeatedly just run a, or a set of iterative steps until this converges. So uh, in, the, in the paper, you can see that I do it with uh, uh, vector Jacobian products. So you don't analytically solve this linear system of equation. You just want to find uh, iteratively uh, almost an approximation to the inversion. Uh, so it's not foolproof because there are many situations where, of course, as you said, if you have a uh, yeah inconsistent system of equation that actually does not have a solution, you would not get the very nice great, uh, inversion. But that's... Uh, I guess that's, yeah, then you have to restart or like, then it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. so the reason why I ask this is because uh, I guess like how you uh, kind of get a system of integrations is, okay, so so I would say it's like different, like if you have more layer answer, then there are more equations that you have to certify, then basically you, you over parameterize your circuits and this will basically affects how effectively you can get a gradient because of this inversion and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So basically I'm just like trying to see like like whether from this gradient, uh this implicit differentiation methods, whether we can get a kind of clue on how to design our answers accordingly so that we can get a stable gradient per se. Yeah. So ah I see. I see. Yeah that that would be interesting. But I let's see. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't actually thought about uh, this part as much because I, I guess, 
Yeah, I guess, you know, you could work your way backwards by by looking at this and then saying, okay, I want something that's nice and invertible. And then you can, yeah, kind of design what kind of circuit you should have such that this is invertible, such that this works and things like that. Yeah, but I haven't looked into it uh, or thought about it, actually. Yeah, and the other industry, yeah, the other thing that I'm thinking of is that uh, now in quantum machine learning, basically, we are trying to encode some symmetry of data inside quantum circuits. And I'm wondering, this will help you kind of like constrain uh, your system of linear equation so that, that the inversion will become effective or what? Yeah, in this case, then it might help a bit. Um, mm. Okay, yeah, so uh, now we have a question from Daniel. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk on slide 21 that you use a step vector simulation with expectation value measures uh, and did you estimate observable using a finite number of shots? No, I did not estimate observables using a finite number of shots because of uh, two reasons. <laughs> the first reason was I just got impatient uh, because when you have a finite number of shots, then you cannot kind of compute these gradients that you need these Jacobians uh, with reverse mode of differentiation. Then you have to actually do this with uh, this parameter shift rule. So you evaluate the circuit at two different parameters and use these two points to get a, a value for the gradient. And this became extremely slow and I could not. Uh, so if you use JAX, you have this tool called just-in-time compilation that just compiles all the circuits and code and makes it fast. It was like, three orders of magnitude slower to compute these gradients with this finite number of shots and things like that. So I, because I had a very limited window of time, I was like, okay, let's see what happens in the ideal case. And then in a future work, we will actually explore what happens uh, when you have finite number of shots. So I, no, I did not do it. And I have, I did it like just, to see what happens, like let, let it run for a couple of uh, days. Actually, we saw that if you have a finite number of shots, your gradient computation actually can go a little wrong and have noise. And because of that, everything blows up. So it could very well be that if you don't have a very good smooth uh, approximation of the gradient, the inversion and everything combined will just give you nonsense and garbage uh, for the implicit gradient. So that's something that should be definitely explored. Okay, thanks. Uh, yep, I think that's good. Um, yeah, actually, um, okay. So so I, I think this would be just a direct uh, implementations of your algorithms, like uh, in, uh, like when you do the optimizations, you are you I guess you are using gradient descent algorithms, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just wondering how uh, much resources that you need uh, when you use quantum natural gradient states because like, over there you have to evaluate uh, the landscape of uh, the cost function and stuff like that to kind of like uh, speed up the calculations or maybe get more information out of the. Uh, Aha, uh -huh, okay. So the quantum natural gradient using the Fisher information. Yeah. So yeah, okay. Um that I'm I'm not sure because if you want to do some resource estimation for this, the first thing that comes in the picture is how do you obtain this Z star A? That's that's one. Let's say you have a way to do this very efficiently. The next question, of course, would be how do you compute these gradients and how many shots you need to get a smooth version and things like that. And honestly, we have not, since we have not done it with finite shots, we have not actually looked at that scaling and these resource estimation. We Here we assume that whatever the quantum computer tells you is the gradient is more or less the gradient. But you're right, if you have maybe, yeah, some other kind of variation, you are not trying to compute this gradient, but the quantum natural gradient or something like that. Uh, maybe there's some benefit, but we have not looked into that. Yeah, um, so yeah, because I'm trying to compare it against with the other algorithms, I I forgot the name. PDSC, basically you are just using uh, the random, like, like you random initialize like two directions and trying to estimate the gradient 
and this will allow you to kind of do the optimizations like quickly i'm trying mm -hmm. to compare these two algorithms yeah that's why i kind of bring out the quantum nature equations um okay so here we have another questions from daniel uh if you need more robustness to short noise you might consider calculations of some quant uh quantized response functions su such mm -hmm. as uh quantized core conductivity as a test problem okay I will actually write it down. That would be that would be interesting because I mean, uh, oh, uh, Daniel, you want to speak up? Uh, it's to to elaborate more. Oh, okay, yeah. So unfortunately, he couldn't speak. I, actually, Daniel just is behind me. Yeah, he's in, uh. in this part. <laughs> uh, he couldn't speak up because uh, he has issue with his mic. Yeah, so uh, maybe okay. No, but that's uh, that's a good uh, comment because I mean we went for the simplest case because this is the first time we even tried to do this. But then, yeah, I mean, if we have quantities that are more robust, uh, where we actually can get away with shock noise in the gradients and things like that, could be interesting. I mean, just the fact that running this algorithm on an actual quantum device, if it actually works, it's it's an open question because as I said, I in the short time that I had, a couple of months, I couldn't uh, find the time to actually run these things on an actual quantum device or even run this with uh, or finite shots and get good results for finite shots. So this would be very interesting uh, because there are different things to this equation right you have this then the inversion of this you have this quantity if these things are not correct as well as you can see here if the ground state solution itself is not correct because you don't have expressive enough ansatz many things can go wrong so it's quite up in the air if all these things will uh, work very nicely but in principle and that's the exciting part in principle if all of these work nicely and you have large quantum devices, you can do something very interesting and useful that you didn't have access to previously, which is to compute these kind of quantities on a quantum computer. Now because now the noise is kind of like affecting this algorithm quite a lot, and we are still not, not sure as like what effect it has on the algorithms. Uh, but to deal with the noise and stuff like that, peop uh, now people start proposing uh, using like do all the uh, variational algorithm in pulse le level. I think like your algorithm should be applied in pulse, le pulse level as well, right? Yeah, then you mm -hmm. uh, yeah, would be able to get rid some of the noise, of course, not all of the noise, but in some sense, uh, your scheme is quite general, right? Yeah, I mean, the formulas, they are quite general, quite simple. Uh, it, it remains to be seen how how robust it will be when you actually have noise because you know if you have completely off values of the gradients and then you invert this uh, or if you have completely off value of the ground state itself and then you try to compute gradients you're like somewhere else that you want to be yeah it might not work the best i see okay um, that's a question that's yeah time. sure can you please repeat how to uh, <clears throat> did the optimization of the pulse state? Like, what are the steps? I think I missed that okay. point there. Yeah. So basically, can... um, so in the, 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 bell, the bell stuff. The... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This one. This one. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, the way that we do it is we start by saying, okay, we have two circuits. Uh, in one circuit, we have these variational parameters that we can change. In the other circuit, we have these variational parameters that we can change. We fix these in the beginning, start from a random initialization of this, these parameters, and then try to optimize to get to, to maximize this quantity. So we want mm -hmm. to find basically, uh, yeah, what's the what's the set of variation parameters that's furthest away from this. Then we compute the implicit gradient. So then we say, okay, once we have this, we, we can plug this into the formula of uh, the entanglement witness, which is, which is the geometric measure of entanglement. Then you get a number, right? You say that, okay, based on this maximization, so if we go back to maybe here, 
uh, this state has a certain amount of entanglement. And how did I find it? I found it by optimizing my variational parameters by fixing this state and computing this quantity. So I'm mm. I get a number for the entanglement. You know, let's say it's uh, here. I think it's normalized. So let's say it's like no entanglement in the beginning because I found some separable state that overlaps or that is exactly the same as my state. So I found some set of parameters here that is exactly the same as the state that is produced by this circuit. So that's that's what I found. Then what I what I want to do is now I want to see, okay, how can I get far away from this, mm. this object? So what I did again here is that I found some set of variational parameters Z star A that gives me a state that's very close to this. What happens if I change my A now? Mm. Which direction should I change my A so that I can increase this gap? So that how do I take the grid, like how do I move away from this point A such that I increase this gap? So then we basically find this the, uh, the implicit gradients for this, and then we run an optimization step to change A to a new A. Mm. Then we repeat again in this sitting at this new A, we start from a set UZ of A, do this, find a new set of UZ A. And if we if we manage so to, you have find to optimize Z from the scratch again. Yeah. So you don't have but you have access to Z star, right? Doesn't it have you? Uh, yeah, so what we do is we we start, I mean, if you do, if you just sit and sit at Z star at one point and you find something here, at the next step, uh, if you now want to calculate the entanglement, actually the new Z star would not be the same. It would be this point, right? It's basically, it should be the um, thing that is closest to the boundary. So what mm. Z star will change for each where you are sitting at A. Because what you want to see is, let's say you are here at A. This would not be the Z star. This would not be the value of the geometric measure of entanglement. This would be the value, right? Because you want to see, you want to get farthest away from the boundary. So then Z star will again change. So that's why you have to resolve for Z star. What you could do, and this is the thing what I do actually, is you start with a, with a Z star, like initial value of Z, which is already Z star. So you could say that, okay, and now I want to start here and see how far my Z star moves, but you still would have to calculate this new Z star because that's just in the definition. You have to maximize over the set of Z, Zs to get as far away as possible or as close as possible. And then you, you keep playing this game uh, and just, update these A's with gradient descent uh, until you saturate or like you find a... Okay, thank you. And just one more, uh, like, is there a way to ensure that you don't run into local minima? Uh, that's the thing, I found... Because you do a great optimization minima. of A, right? So you may end up in a local minima. Yes, so it's very interesting because we found local minima. Sometimes we were stuck actually uh, I think Nathan explained to me as this, that this entanglement, uh, like this measure of entanglement, is some kind of polytope, and you can actually get stuck not in the corners, but in the middle. So you could find a state that's a superposition, let's say, of two entangled states, which actually doesn't keep it entangled, but that's like sometimes the algorithm gets stuck there in the middle of this polytope. And then you just have to restart it. So one mm -hmm. thing that I think we, uh, this was actually like, because Nathan had intuition for it, I think he suggested is that to break some kind, like to, to bias this circuit in some way. So one of the things that we tried is just using not, you know, an arbitrary single qubit unitary here, but just, you know, rotations around Z or X or something like that and bias mm -hmm. it so that we, you are not sitting in the middle. You don't give the circuit too much expressivity. But uh, again, this is uh, a completely heuristic at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, and every time we got stuck, okay, let's start from a new set of points or start with, uh, try to use some noisy version of this gradient descent and things like that. But yeah, we did get stuck many times. Okay, thank you.
Okay, I think uh, now it's 5.03 and there are no other questions. Uh, now, uh, I think we can uh, end the presentation and thanks uh, Shana Watts for uh, taking his time to uh, present this interesting uh, work to us. And I think like, this should spark quite a lot of like interesting ideas uh, to the audience because this one is relatively new and there are quite a lot of applications. Um, yeah. So I think we can uh, end the seminar here. And if you have any questions, then I guess that you can like, draw an email to Sana Watts. Uh, and yeah, yeah. And I think he'll be happy to un uh, answer the questions. Yeah, thanks yes. and see you guys soon. Thank you.